Well, hi, everyone. It's nice to be in Sweden. Um, I'm mostly excited because usually I've been around OpenStack for maybe over 10 years now. A lot of times I go to events and I recognize almost everyone. And I don't recognize a lot of people here, which is really exciting. So just brief intro. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm the CEO at Vexhost. And uh, I've been around OpenStack for 10 years and you know, been from things like the board and the TC and PTL of different projects and maintainers. So, um, I've done my fair share of time. And today I wanted to talk about something um, that I feel is important. Uh, people have always said OpenStack have become boring. And so one of the things we're trying to do is make it more exciting and taking kind of technology and, um, you know, bringing new technologies to OpenStack rather than have it live in the legacy world. Um, so to start, yeah, so the introduction, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the evolution of OpenStack inside Vexhost. So really the idea that I'm talking, I'm going to just talk you through the story of how we got to where we got today. Um, and then after that, you know, how, you know, we started implementing cluster API for Kubernetes. So I'm so glad we had that talk that introduced the cluster API so I don't have to explain what it is. Everybody now, uh, knows what the cluster API is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Keycloak, um, some thoughts around, you know, adding Rust, which I know some people will get excited to, to hear that. Um, and then just kind of how we've open sourced um, all of it. Um, so essentially, OpenStack, we started in the early days of OpenStack. Our first deployment was manually deployed. Um, and it was a deployment running, I think, maybe Grizzly or maybe even older. But it was really old. Um, and essentially, back then, there wasn't a lot of automation. There wasn't a lot of tooling. But we wanted to try OpenStack. We wanted to get it up. And that's what we used um, to get it up at the time. Um, and essentially, that was kind of also the start of our open uh, source journey. Um, we kind of had our own little solution that we built out. And then um, I remember way back when OpenStack had its first developer summit, um, we realized that they're pretty much doing the same exact thing we're doing. So you know what? Let's just kind of tag along. Um, and so our initial public cloud has been running since our first deployment. Um, and to this day, it's been upgraded until now. Um, so we've got an instance. I, I went and I checked our database. And I found our oldest instance has been running since 2015 um, until today. Um, so quite surprised that that's one surprise uh, that one has lasted that long. Um, so then after, at that point, we were like, OK, we got to get some automation going. So we said Puppet. Um, Puppet was the thing back then. Um, this was probably eight, nine years ago. Everybody was using Puppet. It was the first automation. It was either you were either on the Puppet or the chef side. That was one of the things that you had to, to pick. Um, and it worked really well for us um, because also we were working a lot of the with kind of the Red Hat folks, Triple O, Red Hat, OpenStack was also using it. So it was a fair bit of community around it at the time. Um, and I even got involved as having a project team lead in the project as well. So, you know, it worked really well for us. It was easy to manage existing deployments. So if you're spinning up a new compute node and you just want Puppet to install a bunch of packages instead of a bunch of configs, that's great. Um, but we started seeing challenges around like multi-nodes. So we started having customers call us and say, hey, uh, your public cloud's great, but we want our own instance. Um, and to spin up something like that from scratch, I mean, Puppet and multi-node just doesn't really go very well. Um, so at the time, we said, hey, you know what? Let's see what the lay of the land looks like. Um, and the lay of the land at the time was Ansible. That was like the hotness at the time. Everyone was using it. Um, this was like before Red Hat even purchased it when it was kind of still um, on the come up at the time. Um, and it worked really well. So we discovered OpenStack Ansible. At the time, it was driven by some other organizations. And um, we figured, hey, let's tag along. Let's join. Let's start working with them. And it went really well. Um, so I spent a fair few years um, contributing, maintaining, and even being the project team lead for OpenStack Ansible. Um, so it worked really well, helped us get through that portion where now we went to the ability to easily deploy these environments um, as, as, as we need to. But like we started to get some scaling issues. So um, one of the biggest things with Ansible is if you run playbooks and, and, and they start to get a larger scale and a larger number of nodes, it starts to really slow down. Um, and we started to feel like these slowdowns were actually becoming counterintuitive to being able to provide infrastructure as code. Because if you want, just want to say, hey, I want to run these playbooks every time I make a change, it's going to take like an eternity to run all of them. So people start to say, well, I'll just run the playbook with this stack 
tag because I'm making this change. Um, and three months down the line, you get bits because you didn't no, you didn't run this other thing that you forgot about because not the whole playbook has been run. So you get these inconsistencies that start to happen. And so that was kind of an issue. Um, also things like rollbacks and health checks. So you know, usually when you're running things in Ansible, that it's you're dealing with an operating system. So it's kind of hard to orchestrate a rollback on a failure. It's kind of hard to maybe run a health check and make sure that it's running. And if it's not running, then roll back to the virtual, the, to the older virtual environment. It was just kind of a lot of complexity um, there. So we looked at the options and our kind of idea was to start looking at OpenStack Helm, which is essentially a, a set of charts that allow you to deploy uh, OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. So that was the Kubernetes 1.18 era. So it's been a while since then, but Kubernetes was mature enough at the time that we felt like it was a good step to take. Um, and essentially, we started this kind of journey by actually taking all of the environments and slowly converting them to run these services inside um, OpenStack Helm um, on top of Kubernetes. And then um, the way that we were doing it initially was like we would have a bunch of playbooks that would deploy um, uh, Ceph and would deploy Kubernetes because you obviously need those two components to be there. And then we had a bunch of Terraform code that deployed um, the actual Helm charts into the Kubernetes cluster. And that worked really well for us. Um, and, uh, and, and we also implemented you know, OVN at the time, so that added distributed networking. And so this is kind of like the point in time where things started to shift a lot for us because we kind of started, um, and, and you'll see a pattern in this of the, our customers called and they said they have this problem and then we had to do something about it. So the first thing is our customers called and they said, we don't want to be running in your data centers anymore. We want to be running in our data centers. So we were like, okay, no problem. And it was a weird transition because we went from a service company to a software company, but you know, we're still doing both. And so first of all, you know, we said, okay, well, there's a big demand for these on-premise clouds and we want to cover that. Um, the first challenge was Terraform state management. So at the time, Terraform, um, you, and still to this day, you have to have a state that's managed somewhere. It's either going to be using Terraform Cloud or it's going to be a local file or something. And for our on-premise customers, like that was a hassle for them. They needed to figure out how to store this file and they were scared about that file. If they lose it, you know, their cloud state could get all messed up. Um, the uh, security concerns around an unencrypted state, so obviously the state carried you know, things that could be important to the cluster. And to this day, it's still an issue that HashiCorp doesn't address, but the new fork has addressed. So it still kind of was an iffy point. Um, obviously, we didn't know about the HashiCorp licensing thing back then, but now we all do. So we couldn't have seen that one coming, but that was a, a good thing that we, we didn't go there. So what we started doing is we refactored it and we were like, well, Ansible has been doing us pretty well. So we're just gonna actually change um, the component where we're using Terraform to stamp out the Helm charts to Ansible. Um, now you, you might just say, well, hey, you just went back to running Ansible again. Um, and in a sense, yes, but we're only using Ansible to deploy Ceph and Kubernetes. When we're running a, a, a deployment of Keystone, let's say, that's essentially just one task that runs on one node only as opposed to like X amount of nodes. So it doesn't scale linearly because we're just stamping API calls. Um, and then what's really cool is at this point, this is where we started kind of like what we call our atmosphere project. And atmosphere essentially is the combination of all of these different tools um, all working together and all being fully integrated. So atmosphere is actually just an Ansible collection that you can just install from Galaxy. Um, and with this right amount of you know, inventory variables that you would set, you would just end up with a cloud um, automatically. It lives on GitHub and from, from then till now, it's all fully open sourced. Um, everything that happens inside of it, we're at over 1,500 commits, um, and pretty much it's what we roll out um, to our customers. And really the goal of it also is to minimize the amount of configuration that we have to do out of the box. Um, it's that like we all know when we get a, a, an OpenStack cloud up, there's a million knobs and things to tune, and we've got 10 years of experience, so we figured, um, you know, in the VMware world, people, they take the ISO, they burn it on a CD, they put it in the system and they get ESXi and it just works. Um, and we just wanted to replicate that experience where you install and it just works. Uh, you don't have to understand all those um, intricate details. And, you know, that's what we were trying to, to aim to do. 
And so Kubernetes gave us a lot of power out of the box because now we can tap into a brand new ecosystem that has so many things that everybody's excited about um, and we don't have to build it all from scratch. So things like the Kubernetes stack uh, monitoring, which is like a monitoring stack for all of uh, Kubernetes and all the nodes that it comes and everything, that's a hugely popular Helm chart that exists already in Kubernetes. And now all of a sudden we can just tap that in and bring in all that community and all that open source experience and just bring that um, into us. Uh, Vector and Loki, well, so uh, Vector is a lock shipping tool uh, similar to, um, what is it like the Grafana, there's the Grafana agents or whatever it is that you would use to ship logs. But Vector is a really powerful tool um, and Loki uh, as well, which is Loki is the Grafana uh, lock server that receives these. But what's really cool is instead of you know, having to build a bunch of infrastructure manually and wire it up and all of that, we can just deploy a Helm chart and get a vector daemon set running on every single one of our nodes that takes all the system D logs and all the container logs and pushes it straight into Loki, which is also managed by a Helm chart. And so the complexity of maintaining all that code and all these like maybe Ansible roles or anything has all disappeared. And we're now part of a new ecosystem. We're part of the Kubernetes ecosystem. So there's a lot that we can tap into um, from there. Um, day two operations. So we've got pretty much a Kubernetes operator for any external service that we can run. So we went from you know, having to deal with a role that installed RabbitMQ and all of that to instead just installing the RabbitMQ operator that is built by the same team that has built RabbitMQ. And we just leverage that operator to launch RabbitMQ clusters as we need them. The database is the same thing. So for, rather than having to maintain the code to deploy a MariaDB or a Percona ExtraDB cluster for the Galera, we do the same exact thing for this and we install the Percona ExtraDB cluster operator and then we've got a database cluster built by Percona, the database company that built this whole thing. So we feel a lot more confident in these databases because you know, they're taking care of all that operation on the smarts and we can focus on the OpenStack um, components. And so that's really the biggest kind of driver that we started getting, right? So the, the monitoring, the logging, all these improved things that we can um, jump into. The next thing, so this is where customers calls us again and says, hey, um, we need to integrate with our authentication. So OpenStack historically has had federated authentication. So it can integrate natively with OpenID Connect or SAML. It can also integrate with LDAP. But the integrations have, in our opinion, been pretty weak, mainly because there, it's hard to actually, you know, it's, it's a bunch of Apache um, modules that sit and proxy between it and Keystone, and, and it's just very hacky overall. It's not also not very intuitive um, and doesn't scale very well. So what we did is actually start deploying Keycloak as part of um, uh, Atmosphere, which again, very easy, just use the Helm chart and we've got it. And then what we've done is integrate that with um, OpenStack. So by default, all the Atmosphere installations have Keycloak authentication. So we really feel like our main authentication platform is Keycloak rather than the built-in one in, in, in OpenStack. Um, and so what that allows you is once you get an OpenStack deployment off the ground, you can just log into Keycloak and integrate with your favorite identity provider. You want people to log in with your Azure AD or your Okta or whatever it is, and it just works out of the box. You can integrate it with LDAP as well works out of the box, create any groups, just all works out of the box. And so that's kind of what we wanted to accomplish. Um, another difficulty that we also saw uh, if you're doing federated authentication is you would never see the user appear unless they logged in once. And we all know that's really hard to do to be like, yeah, to assign this person access, you have to call them and be like, hey, can you log in once? And then after you logged in once, then we can add you to, to, to whatever role or anything. And so we built a Keystone Keycloak backend, and essentially that's a backend for Keystone that relies on the Keycloak API. So when you do a user list in Keystone, it'll pull the users directly through um, Keycloak, and the same thing for the groups. So that means that even if a user has never logged into your OpenStack cloud, you can do a user list and you'll still see that user and assign them to any project you want or anything that you kind of want from there. So essentially we've focused on Keystone for authentication, and then kind of left, sorry, Keycloak for authentication and left Keystone to just do authorization. Um, and so then our customer called again and said, that's great for dashboards, but how do I deal with CLI? Because I still, the, we still have usernames and passwords for those. 
And so the way we've worked around that and uh, what we've done is essentially said, you know what, we're going to disable logging in with the passwords through the Keycloak integration. And what we're going to do is we built a custom driver, which is the Keystone Auth Web SSO. And what that will do is that's a Python package that you would install with your Python OpenStack client on your machine. And when you actually do any CLI commands, what it will do is it will launch a browser window on your computer, redirect to Keycloak, do the authentication process, whether that is going through LDAP or Azure AD or whatever. And then once it completes, that window will close and you will have a token cached on your system. Once that token expires, it'll go ahead and get another one and you'll go through that process again. And so by doing that, essentially, we've eliminated all human access to the cloud that doesn't involve being brokered through Keycloak. So if you have to enforce MFA, if you have to enforce anything, that all happens there. Another really key and useful thing with Keycloak is one of the challenges was if you were using federated users and you disabled that user um, in your federated system, like you disabled them in you know, Azure AD, that didn't propagate to OpenStack until they actually logged in and all their stuff synced afterwards. With the system that we've set up with Keycloak, if they're disabled, they're instantly disabled everywhere. So all their application credentials, anything else, they all automatically get voided. So it's a kind of a full two-way sync um, for that kind of authentication side of things. So then we've solved that. And our customer called us again and said, hey, um, Kubernetes is very tough on OpenStack. Um, and the Magnum project, if you've had the displeasure of working with it, uh, you probably had a lot of frustrations. Uh, you're probably not happy about heat and the whole way that it's done. Uh, and so every couple of months, our customers will call us and say, hey, we need to run a newer version of, of, of uh, Kubernetes. Can you please uh, go and fix this mess of bash scripts for us to be able to run the next one? And so we go and we do that, and we, and, you know, we kept going through that loop. So eventually, um, our customer told us to do that. We didn't listen to them. And in the same time that we would have done to implement a new um, uh, version for like the seventh time, we just built the cluster API driver. So thanks to the earlier presentation, I don't have to explain to you how the cluster API works. Everybody now knows how the cluster API works. But what's great about this is essentially all that Magnum is doing is taking requests from users and translating them into um, YAML, you know, and pushing that into the management cluster that we run. And since Atmosphere runs on top of Kubernetes anyways, that's a management cluster that we have to, that's already there, so we don't have to build a new one. And all we just do is just take those requests that we get from the user and just apply them to the existing cluster. And the cluster API combined with the cluster API provider for OpenStack does all of that for us. We don't have to do anything else. Um, obviously, I'm trivializing it. Uh, because obviously at first, we that's how easy we thought it was, and now we're 500 commits into the project, and there's so many other things that we had to build in order to make it work. Um, but you know that's essentially one of the things that we have done um, and, and made it so we can improve it. And so Magnum now essentially is just an API wrapper around the cluster API. And what's powerful about that is, well, all the users that already were using cluster API, uh, Magnum can now just keep using Terraform or the CLI or the Horizon dashboard, and they'll get a Kubernetes cluster that's super reliable with auto healing, auto scaling, rolling upgrades, all the fancy stuff the cluster API gets, and they don't have to know anything about how it's working behind the scenes. It's all delivered um, for them. So that's been really, really powerful. Um, and what I want to kind of just stress really quickly is all the stuff that I've mentioned, we've built as fully independent components not part of Atmosphere. Atmosphere is an integration of all of these out of the box, if you want them all. But if you're like, this sounds really cool, um, well, we've worked with a lot of other communities, so if you're running Coal Ansible, you can use this driver. It's actually already been pre-integrated in the latest uh, Kola release. If you're like, oh, I use OpenStack Ansible, one of the contributors of OpenStack Ansible have already done a lot of work and integrated it with OpenStack Ansible and, and made it work that way. So. All of these are different components that are improving the overall ecosystem, but Atmosphere is kind of like the, the all-in package that has everything um, already you know, set up. So essentially, the service support also in Atmosphere is something that we focused on. So we really wanted these services to run out of the box. So for those that have kind of been around OpenStack for a while, for example, the load balancing service, a lot of times will require you to set up a fully separate network, and that will be your management network. And then you know there's like a bunch of complexities around it. We completely abstract that. We create a VXLAN network and mesh the um, health manager system directly into it. So you don't even have to have that extra network set up. 
Um, for things like Manila, we do the same exact thing. So all you really need to deploy it is just two networks, your management network where all your you know, hypervisors and control plane servers are, and just the external networks where your VMs are gonna be connected inside of, and that's it. No like 14 VLANs and you know, 12 physical networks and all of that. It's really simplified down, uh, but it's still super micro segmented. Um, one of the other things is, well, since now we're running Docker images, we can do security scanning on our images. So we run Trivi on all of our images to make sure they're all you know, secure and there's no uh, vulnerabilities or any CVEs in there. Um, we also sign all of our um, images that we publish in Atmosphere. So we have a public key that we publish so users can actually use you know, attestation checking with Cosign and make sure that the images that we're giving are the real images as opposed to you know, someone who managed to upload an image on our behalf that they shouldn't have so those images are, are fully signed. Um, and we, what we've been doing is also kind of um, backporting a lot of feature changes that OpenStack policies don't allow. So for example, we've recently backported some feature improvements around encrypted volumes. So um, a funny thing just to kind of lighten up the mood, um, currently OpenStack, when you create a new encrypted volume, if you create a one terabyte volume, it writes a one terabyte empty like data, like one terabyte of zeros on the disk and then uploads it to your Ceph cluster. Um, I don't know how that got past all of the amounts of code review that we get, but nobody raised a question about like that that's an awful idea. But we've, so that way if you created, you know, our customer reason, I was like, when we were creating two terabyte volumes, it's taking 20 minutes. Um, and we figured, yeah, because they're just writing zeros to disk the whole time. So we, we made some changes around that and now it just writes it directly to the, to, the, to the cluster and takes like five seconds. But it's things like that that wouldn't be allowed to be backported as part of the OpenStack policies, but we've kind of, taken them and backported them anyways. So those part of the image builds that we publish um, as part of Atmosphere. So the future things that we'd like to see. So I know a lot of people maybe in this room or, or not, there's kind of a lot of excitement around Rust and the fact that it's an, a highly performant language. Um, but I think what's more exciting about it is that it highly integrates with Python. So the Py03 project actually allows you to create Python bindings um, for any Rust library in a very simple way. And what that can allow actually is allow us to start building these Rust-based libraries um, that would have their dependencies all built in, statically built, as opposed to having a sprawl of dependencies, just like in the OpenStack world right now, um, that make it so that you end up with a huge virtual environment with many different packages. Um, but instead you're building it all statically into the same uh, project and it could be a transitionary thing where some of those libraries can slowly start to disappear and be replaced by um, something that embeds all of the other functionality um, directly in. So this has been something that we've tried and started to do with some of the Magnum Cluster API project things. And by doing that, we're actually able to minimize the actual footprint of the driver itself. So we've reduced the amount of external dependencies that we pull in. So when you just install it, nothing else gets installed because that's the only thing. It pulls, it pulls nothing in, it's just a single binary. Um, what would be even nicer is eventually in a world where all the OpenStack stuff adopts all of this, then the OpenStack components could be single binaries, just like how Kubernetes enjoys a world of a single binary for all their services. Um, and so we can have very lightweight single binary containers, um, but we're not there yet and we have very heavy-ish containers with virtual environments that are sitting and I think that's just gonna be how we have to deal with things for now. But this is one of those things that we're working kind of on the background of the long term to try and improve. Um, RabbitMQ, so who actually here runs an OpenStack Cloud? Um, great, who had a problem with RabbitMQ in their history of OpenStack Cloud? That's funny, it's like 100% rates. Um, so RabbitMQ is a big pain. I don't know why it's always been a big pain for all the operators at any scale. And so one of the things that we've been working on in the background as well um, is actually just removing the dependency on RabbitMQ. Um, if you think about RabbitMQ for most of the project, it kind of has two purposes. One is to make cast calls for the different backend services, like for example, Nova Conductor or Nova Scheduler. So when you deploy a new VM, the schedulers, one of them will be listening to a cast call that it will pick up the request and just say, hey, I'll, I'll do the scheduling for this and give the response back. That's one of them. And the other one is just direct 
to specific agent communication. So it could be a specific uh, Nova API calling to a specific Nova compute saying, please get me the console logs for this system. Those can easily be replaced by very simple RPC calls. And the very fact that when now in Atmosphere, we're running everything in uh, with service discovery built in. So we already know where all the different hosts are. Uh, we already know that if we need to make a call for this host, we already have the IP address for it. We have all that information. So the idea is if you've been around in OpenStack for a while, you remember there was a zero MQ implementation a long time ago. And we're trying to kind of piggyback on that, but instead using um, gRPC. And so that completely makes it really simple and essentially makes it so that all the different services, the OpenStack services are just listening on a port and they're, they're receiving RPC requests and responding directly back to the other host. Um, that's an oversimplification. There's gonna be cases where it needs to be brokered in some way because the control plane cannot reach the actual compute nodes because of network limits or anything like that. But for the most part, I've been around OpenStack for a long time, and it's very rare that there's a scenario where there might be a control plane system that has no reachability at all to any of the compute nodes. They're mostly usually all in the same layer two, layer three domain. They can usually talk to each other, um, and that's kind of some of the requirements that makes it work in, in the same time. So by doing that, even, you know, even, even deployment tools that don't rely on service discovery, they can just start having in, internal backends in HA proxy that, for example, point to Nova Conductor or point to Nova Schedule or, or, or stuff like that. And then we can just eliminate RabbitMQ for good and we can all be happy. Um, but this is still an in progress thing and we're still kind of making a little bit of headway on it. Um, but hopefully um, that's something that is going to simply be a full on replacement because we're doing this on the Oslo messaging layer, which is the messaging layer used by OpenStack projects. So if we manage to get it right and get it working there, we can just flip it out for all the services um, and then we can all uh, not have uh, any more RabbitMQ uh, issues. So this is more on kind of a maintenance and availability side of things. Two another projects that we have also started to uh, work on and have some progress on. So Sunrise is a project that is um, coming about replacing Horizon. So obviously we all know how Horizon is like the, stand, the, the, the great standard that has never been changed. Um, Sunrise is kind of a new approach to it. Sunrise is actually a Next.js app that relies on server side uh, rendering. It also relies on doing direct cores requests to the OpenStack APIs. So instead of actually having the, the having a middle layer that the services are talking to that talks to OpenStack, instead the client themselves from the browser is talking directly to the OpenStack API. And so that eliminates a whole middle layer that just doesn't need to exist for whatever reason. Um, and so there's kind of still work on there. It natively supports um, you know, um, identity, like web SSO out of the box as well. So you can log in with username and password or with the key cloak that we just uh, were talking about earlier. Um, and so that's kind of the coverage for that. The other one is Stratometrics, which is a high performance billing API. So obviously billing and usage is a big thing in OpenStack and historically there's been many different solutions and at our scale, we've never found one that actually survived, uh, mainly because a lot of them are not event-driven, and so when you're not event-driven, you end up with a huge overload of data. So if you have a VM running for six years, and that VM has never been stopped and just started once, that's, in the non-evented system, that's six years of data that you have to maintain and run queries or whatever, whereas what we're doing is something more event-based where we're actually just storing the different events and then figuring out the deltas between those different events to figure out how long something has been running. So right now, in the current state that it's there, it's a Go project. We've actually benchmarked it up to a million uh, virtual machines. And so the assumption of having like five, a million events or 500,000 creates and deletes, and we can get queries like responded on my laptop in like 20 milliseconds on just a normal MySQL database server. It requires a bit of a more modern MySQL server, but you know, it's all built on a very giant, ugly blob of um, SQL that I hope no one ever has to look at again because it's uh, terrifying, but it gets the job done. Um, and so essentially that also integrates with Keystone. So users can simply um, get all their information from there. Um, they can get all their information um, from uh, key, uh, using Keystone so they can get a token, make an API call and get usage for their projects. And as an admin, you can get usage for all the different projects. So it's also self-service or user-facing um, API as well. 
And uh, yeah, I'm uh, very short on time. I talk a lot, so I try my best to be on time. This is, the, this is the screenshot slide, this is the photo slide. If you're interested in all the different projects, these are all the different projects that I talked about today. They're all on GitHub and they're all composable. So if you need to use any or all, you can use them. You don't have to use Atmosphere to do all of this. And uh, yeah, thank you so much everybody. Appreciate it and uh, thank you. And uh, about the time, you're actually really on time and everyone's been really on time. So that's uh, actually quite nice. So any questions uh, before we go to coffee break? Yes, I'll throw the thing again. They're busy. <laughs> Can we get a mic? Uh, okay. Can we? <laughs> it's a super interesting and I would. No? 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 no. <laughs> you should just go. I can throw it. Sorry, I don't yeah. <laughs> okay, for the third time. It was super interesting and I would have tons of questions, but I'll just have one now. The Keystone Auth Web SSO seems. Excellent, and it's definitely what we need. Is it in any way tied to Keycloak, or can you do, you do it with any OIDC stuff? In um, as Keystone? long as you have enabled dashboards equals lo HTTP localhost, and I don't remember the port, you're good to go. As long as you're using the federation built in in, in uh, Keystone, that's all you need. Nothing, no add-on, no add-ons on the server. Excellent, and it's in pip, I guess. So yeah, and it's also install. installable from pip. We publish it on PyPy, so it's pip install directly. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Also, I'll be around, you can talk to me, I'll be around in the evening as well, so anybody feel free to drag for more questions. Hey, uh, I have two questions, yeah. two different areas, uh, about the project that you said that uh, for the billing API, that you said uh, it's uh, event-based, it's based on the Sailometer event, it's my first, first question, and if it's yes, uh, um, collecting all of these metrics based on the, you know, the time range and, you know, the duration that you want to keep it uh, takes more storage and how uh, you handle it. It's my first question. Yeah. So we're not using Solometer events. We actually, we're listening to the same bus that Solometer used to listen at, which is the notification bus of OpenStack, but we're actually capturing the events ourselves and just adding them um, ourselves to our database. And the database, we've modeled it. It doesn't need that much space because essentially what we're storing is like project ID, event time, and then some properties that we consider properties that change the state of the, um, of the resource. So for example, if a server gets started and uh, like uh, start up and shut down, we don't consider this as a state change because we bill it anyways. But if the instance type changes, that's a state change. So we'll log a new event for that. So at the end of the day, it's very small. And the idea is we feel like if you use indexes, you can you start using you know, MySQL partitioning for that kind of thing. You can do per database. There's kind of easy ways to work around that. But we found that like at a million records, you can easily just archive the old records and uh, keep them out of the way. Uh, thank you. And uh, about the Magnum Cluster API, I used this project six months ago, I think, uh, and I want to try it for this stage and after that for the production in my previous company. And uh, after that, we you know, launched the uh, Kubernetes successfully with the Cluster API in Magnum. We faced one issue. We want to use you know, the Octavia as a load balancer for worker, for services that runs on a worker. And uh, we have a very long HAProxy configuration for example, for one service, is 3,000 lines, and we want to inject it directly to the Amphora, yeah. uh, but after that, we understand that the Octavia databases cannot be updated after that we, you know, for example, for the listener and for other things. And uh, this kind of inconsistency, uh, you know, ignore us um, to, you know, use the Octavia for the load balancing in a, you know, service, a level and we, you know, we use the Nginx and some other things uh, for our services. And uh, uh, do you want to, I don't know, what do you think about it? Uh, I think that we are used as a load balancer in the Magnum Cluster API. And uh, is it good that uh, 
make it better or you know get rid of I don't know yeah. what do you think about it for the workload clusters usually what we suggest is if you're just going to be sending HTTP we suggest just the normal OpenStack controller manager and that will just take care of it'll create a load balancer and it will be bound to the um, uh, sorry if you're doing anything like just normal we just use the normal cloud controller manager and that will create a Octavia load balancer and then it will link it to your Kubernetes one. A lot of times if you have complex setups, I just, we don't suggest the Octavia, um, uh, what is it called? The Octavia like load, uh, ingress or Octavia load balancer controller, but rather just use the built-in Kubernetes one and then rely on your complex routing inside Kubernetes as opposed to using the Octavia ingress controller manager because that one, the Octavia Ingress is not very powerful or flexible. So I would, I would personally just do the most basic Octavia setup um, and then just do all your complex routing and your, uh, your, your unfortunate 3,000 lines of HA proxy still inside of Kubernetes um, if it's hard to, to def defactor that, let's say. Thank you. And you can press to the next slide. Because there is one. Um, coffee break. Uh, 